This is the story of how God Almighty went on an eternal search that was born of love and cost his blood, the story of his holy church. We were at first disembodied. Our limbs and bodies were active practitioners of misanthropy. We were fingers without hands, wrists with no arms, shoulders without chest, parts without form, heels with no foot, knees with no leg, toes with no step, appendages with no head. We were lost and stranded wanderers, doomed to die alone. But that was before God graciously left his throne. For eons Eons ago, in the space and time where only eternity grows, the only truly unified body existed in divinity, and it is forever known as the Trinity. Now this celestial anatomy, this father, son, and spirit assembly, this family of one, yet panoply of many, is and was and will forever be the only hope for humanity, for it is and was and will forever be the only only true embodiment of unity. But for many, something didn't seem right. For if this son, this God, this savior, this king was the hope for the world, why is he dying on this tree? If he was to renew our bodies, why is his being torn apart? If he was to give us eternal life, why is his ending among thieves and guards? But these questions were asked by those who only see wounds as scars. For as he was torn, we were mended. As he was ashamed, we were perfected. As he was ripped, we were sewn. As he was opened, we were closed. And though the one true body is back on his throne, you may know that the one true body lives on here below. For his body did rise, yet in leaving it did not die, but lives on in the church, the unified body of Christ. But it wasn't just for a body that God sent his son to die. It was for an eternal companion. It was for a bride. As it is written, it is for this reason that man shall leave his father and hold fast to his wife. So the son left the father so that the two may become one flesh, may become one life. And though there is but one husband, we are of much flesh, red and yellow, black and white, Baptist, Lutheran, church. Church of Christ, yet no matter the color or affiliation of one of 10,000 racial, economical, or denominational stripes, when we became Christians, we left our fathers for the husband, and we all form the bride of Christ. For we were 10,000 weak, 10,000 undone, but now the church is becoming the bride, and 10,000 with Christ shall be made one. But God's goodness was not then done, his plan not yet complete for he wanted to live with his new bride, so he made his wife a building. Now we are living stones, breathing bricks, laughing lumber, surviving sticks, built bit by bit, inch by inch, together with every Christian the groom admits. Together we knit one on top of the other as we submit around the pillars of the apostles and prophets, all coming to sit on the one foundation of Christ, the structures magnet. We are the church, the only building no force in heaven nor on earth could purge. The ark that holds the eternal God, the temple that trembles with his spirit surge. And so I urge you, you body, you bride, you building, you church, to not abandon, profane, or neglect God's church, his perfect work. Fight boldly for the body, love deeply the bride, live holy in in the building, for I tell you, we are for what Christ has died. We are the assembly of the saints, the congregation of the upright. We are where heaven inhabits. We are the fold of Christ. We are the branch of God's planting, the meeting of the firstborn. We are heaven and earth's family. We are the heritage of the Lord. We are the chosen people. We are the holy nation. We are the royal 
priesthood, God's special reclamation. We are the temple, we are the city, we are the vineyard, the sanctuary. We are the body, we are the bride, we are the building, we are the church. We are the construction of eternity's eternal holy work. So we will never dismember the flesh. We will never divorce the wife. We will never dismantle the house. We will never dismiss the price, but we'll lay everything down for our everlasting tribe, for we are the church. We are the people of Christ. We could almost just go home from that. Well, in Matthew chapter 16, uh, Jesus says to Peter, Upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And though Peter and the other disciples would, would all soon after that fall and deny Jesus at his time of, of greatest need uh, at the trial and in his crucifixion, the church would find its start rising out of the ashes of their betrayal. Fifty days after Jesus' resurrection and ten days after his ascension, his return to heaven, the disciples waited in a room prayerfully anticipating what was going to happen next. And what was going to happen next was the fulfillment of the promise that Jesus made to them in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where he said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, it all became a reality. It says, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. In that moment, in that instant when the Holy Spirit came to rest upon all of those present, the church that Jesus spoke of was born. And despite centuries of trials and persecution, Centuries of, of dissension and, and disillusionment, despite wars that have been waged against the church, despite all of the untold numbers of battles within the church, the powers of hell have indeed found no way to conquer it. And what began as 12 ordinary, unschooled, and somewhat terrified men has continued to grow and to grow and to grow and to change the world. Now, some will tell you that the church is losing its power and its grasp in our world, it's becoming watered down and, and, and weak and shallow. And, and while there are segments that are indeed watering down the message, and there are segments that are stirring disunity and walking away from foundational theological tenets, I would question whether or not those churches, those so-called churches, those groups of people that we find graying out God's call and in trying to erase God's standards, I would question whether or not they are even a part of the church at all. No matter what they claim. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 through 7 says this, This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you, God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. But if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If a church says they have fellowship with God, 
that they are a part of his body, and yet they continue to blatantly walk in the darkness, they are not the church. They are not the body of Christ. But let me issue a word of caution. Just as we need to consider the possibility that there are segments of Christianity that have separated themselves from the truth of Jesus and are no longer a part of that same body, uh, we need to also be careful not to demonize Bible-believing, God-honoring, Christ-centered churches simply because they don't agree with us on everything or that they may do things differently than we do, or, or their focus and, and priorities may be different than ours. Because you see, when we do that, when we write off another church that's seeking to walk in the light and to walk in fellowship with God just because they are different than us, then we are disparaging the bride of Christ. And to Jesus, that's serious. You remember what he said in Ephesians 5, uh, in verses uh, 25 to 27? He says, for husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean. Washed by the cleansing of God's word, he did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. You see, Jesus desires to see the church flourish. He desires to see it presented without a spot, without a a, a blemish. And when we seek to stand against his church, whether that's because we've compromised the standards or whether that's because we've been writing off another congregation because of their differences, when we stand against his church, in reality, we stand against Jesus. Because Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not overcome it. Charles Spurgeon states it this way. He says, there are various estimates of the Christian church. Some think everything of her. Some think nothing of her. And probably neither opinion is worth the breath which utters it. Neither ritualists who idolize their church nor skeptics who vilify all churches have any such knowledge of the true spiritual church of Jesus Christ as to be entitled to give an opinion. I wish he'd say how he felt. The king's daughter, he says, is all glorious within, with a beauty which they are quite unable to appreciate. It is evident that the divine bridegroom gives his bride a high place in his heart, And to him, whatever she may be to others, she is fair, lovely, comely, beautiful, and in the eyes of his love without a spot. Moreover, even to him there is not only a beauty of a soft and gentle kind in her, but a majesty, a dignity in her holiness, in her earnestness, in her consecration. She is every inch a queen. Her aspect in the sight of her beloved is majestic. To his discerning eye, she is not weak, dishonorable, and despicable, but bears herself as one of the highest rank, consciously, joyously strong in her Lord's strength. In all her victories, in all her seeming shortcomings, the church is still the bride. The church is still the body of Christ, and Jesus said that all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Never will they be able to conquer it. And out of all the ways that he chose, or that he could have chosen to accomplish his purposes, he chose fallible, fickle, and fragile human beings to do so. 
And he didn't just set them into one building in one location. He formed many of different creeds and denominations, different methods in personalities, different approaches, different structures. And through it all, he has intentionally designated and designed the church with this truth. The church is God's primary way to accomplish his purposes on earth today. The church is God's primary way to accomplish his purposes on earth today. Randy Frazee, uh, who's the author of uh, the belief study we're doing, I don't think this is in, uh, in the belief book, but he said at, at one point, he said the church is God's plan A and there is no plan B. Amen. The church is God's plan A. There is no plan B. It is the primary way he's going to accomplish his purposes on earth today. And because of that, we need to stop trying to save the church, and we need to be the church. How do we do that? How do we effectively join God in his plan A? I think it's simple, but it's just me. You see, because the church is not a building but a people, he accomplishes his purposes as you and I grow in our relationship with him. And as you and I grow and as we are transformed, we begin to impact those around us, or at least we should be impacting those around us. And if we're not impacting those around us, then you need to readdress whether, you're not, uh, whether or not you're even following Jesus. But as you grow and you begin to impact those around you, uh, they begin to see Jesus. And as they begin to see Jesus, their lives begin to change. And when their lives begin to change and they are transformed, when they are growing in a relationship with Jesus, then they too begin to impact their world. God's plan A, his plan for the church to be the primary way in which uh, he will accomplish his purposes starts with you and it starts with me. I'd like for us to read this morning from the book of Romans chapter 12. Now, you can attempt to follow along in your own uh, Bible, but um, I'm going to be reading from Eugene Peterson's translation, The Message, and so I've got the words on the screen here for you to follow along a little more effectively, because uh, it is a little hard to follow if you're reading one of the other translations and reading his at the same time. But here's how you and I see God's purposes accomplished in and through us and thus through the church. Verse one, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life. Your sleeping, eating, going to work, and uh, walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. That's transformation. That is transformation, the power of God's Holy Spirit in your life. He continues, readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. I'm speaking to you out of deep gratitude for all that God has given me, and especially as I have responsibilities in relation to you. Living then as every one of you does in pure grace, it's important that you not misinterpret yourselves as people who are bringing this goodness to God. No, God brings it all to you. The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what he does for us, not by what we are and what we do for him. In this way, we are like the various parts of a human body. Each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. The body we're talking about is Christ's body of chosen people. 
Christ's body is you and I. Unified, unique, but unified. But let me tell you, it's not just you and I as individuals. It's our church and somebody else's church and somebody else's church and somebody else's church. That's the bride of Christ. That's the body of Christ. He continues, each of us finds our meaning and function as a part of his body but as a chopped off finger or a cut off toe, we wouldn't amount to much, would we? So since we find ourselves fashioned into all these excellently formed and marvelously functioning parts in Christ's body, let's just go ahead and be what we were made to be without enviously or pridefully comparing ourselves with each other or trying to be something we aren't. You can't be reminded of this enough. God has uniquely shaped each of us for his service. We each are an integral part of the body of Christ, an integral part of the church. And let me continue to to force this issue because the reality is, is that our church is a unique part and been uniquely shaped for the body of Christ. We may just be the foot. And not until all of the churches come together are we the body. But we need to keep reminding ourselves that, you know what, we are Christ's body. We've been uniquely shaped, uniquely designed for his service. Continuing verse 6, if you preach, just preach God's message, nothing else. If you help, just help. Don't take over. If you teach, stick to your teaching. If you give encouraging guidance, be careful that you don't get bossy. If you're put in charge, don't manipulate. If you're called to give aid to people in distress, keep your eyes open and be quick to respond. If you work with the disadvantaged, don't let yourself get irritated with them or depressed by them. Keep a smile on your face. Love from the center of who you are. Love from the center of of who you are. You see, here in this passage, Paul connects our worship of God with our role in the church. It's connecting who we are and who we are becoming with our doing and our being. It's what this whole believe study is all about. It's thinking, acting, and becoming like Jesus. And so Paul is connecting our worship uh, with our role. Uh, In other words, Paul is saying that a transformed church, a church that is actively involved in God's work, begins with a transformed people. It's individuals who have committed themselves to to the process of becoming all God has designed uh, for them to be. But unfortunately, what we see many times within the church is that we see people who call themselves Christians fulfilling their functions within the church without ever seeing their lives changed for Christ. Without ever seeing true spiritual formation taking place. And as a result, we end up with an entire community full of good religious people who act one way on Sunday and entirely different on Monday through Saturday. In those churches that have lost their power, in those churches that have have become ineffective and, uh, and shallow, they are that way because they are full of people whose Sunday life doesn't match the rest of their life. And we need to understand right from the start, our Sunday life was never meant to be separated from our Monday through Saturday life. We are to be men and women radically committed to Jesus Christ, transformed 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, year after year, after year, after year, it stops when your breath stops. So how does Paul suggest we do that? By taking our everyday life and laying it down before Christ. 
and embracing the transformation that he wants to do in and, in and through our lives so that we can take part in the privilege of drawing others to himself. See, a transformed church has transformed people, and transformation begins when individuals come to the point in their life when their spiritual growth is more important than their comfort. When being involved in an active and growing relationship with Jesus is more important than fitting into our world or resting on our laurels. Life transformation begins with a conscious choice to lay it all before God. The NIV translation describes this start as a sacrifice. It says, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. And in an article in Christianity Today some time ago, Eugene Peterson uh, describes a sacrifice. And he says, a sacrifice is an offering placed before the Lord so that he can make something of it. Once offered, it is in God's hand to do with what he will. It is no longer in your hands to improve a little more. His will is to work with offerings, not your perfections or your press clippings. Just leave it. You've lived your day. Now leave it on the altar in offering. Paul says that when we do this, when we, when we offer ourselves in this manner, we will be changed from the inside out. And it's at that point, he says in, in verses 2 and 3, uh, that God will bring the best out in you. He will develop well-formed maturity in you. In other words, God will make you holy. Life transformation, it begins with that conscious choice to, to lay it all before God. And once you do that, once you've laid your life down as an offering uh, to God, then you are in a position uh, to see that life transformation takes place as we yield to and embrace our God-given roles as a member of the body of Christ. Verse 4 through 6 again says, In this way we are like the various parts of a human body, each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. The body we're talking about is Christ's body of chosen people. Each of us finds our meaning and function as a part of his body. We each have our own unique compilation of spiritual gifts, heart passions, abilities, passions, and experiences. It's a life that was intentionally and thoughtfully designed by God. King David in Psalm 139 says that we were knit together in our mother's womb. My mom used to knit. It was painstaking detail. I never quite understood what she was doing. I tried it a few times. But she was knitting together what I thought were masterpieces of Afghans and, and wonderful slippers. God has knit us together as individuals. God has knit us together as churches. God has knit us together as his body. But even with that uh, incredible individual attention, he never meant for us to live the Christian walk as an isolated island of our own skills and talents. And again, that's not just for us as individuals. Churches were never meant to live as isolated islands of their own skills and talents. We are part of the body of Christ, and our role is important to that healthy function of ourselves and of the body as a whole. Ephesians 4.16 says, From Him, Jesus Christ, from Him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. We can't be truly a transformed person if we're not living it out in community. You and I need other people to help us live a healthy and growing relationship with Jesus Christ. 
If you're like me, you may be an introvert who loves to get off on his bicycle and go in the middle of the Cardinal Greenway somewhere between Muncie and Richmond and just be there all by himself. I like that. I enjoy it. It it, it fuels me. But somehow the older I get, the more I realize relationship is vital for all of us even those of us who prefer to be alone. Here in, the, uh, in America in the 21st century, that's a hard concept for us to grasp sometimes. We're taught to be our own person. We're taught to live our own life. Don't rely on other people. Don't trust anyone other than yourself. And even in our own spiritual walks, we're told that our relationship with Jesus Christ is private and individual. And yet, if you look through many parts of the world today, uh, third world countries, this is, this is common. Uh, Japan, I think, this is, a, is common. If you look in these uh, other places in the world, it is the group that is the focus. The group is the center of life. Your individual decisions impact the group, for better or for worse. And if the individual is suffering, the whole group suffers. If the group suffers, the individual suffers. There is no separation between me and we. God has created us to live in community as the body of Christ, and we've each been designed to build up the entire body. A man named Charles Plum, this good-looking guy up here, was a Naval Academy graduate, and he was a jet fighter pilot in Vietnam. And after 75 combat missions, his plane was destroyed by a a surface-to-air missile, and Plum ejected and parachuted uh, into the enemy's hands. He was captured, and he spent six years in a communist prison. He survived the ordeal, and today uh, he gives motivational speeches about lessons learned from that experience. But one day, quite some time ago, when Plum and his wife were sitting in a restaurant eating dinner, a man at another table came up and he said, you're Charles Plum, you flew fight jet uh, jet fighters uh, in Vietnam uh, from the aircraft carrier Kitty Hawk. You were shot down. And, And Plum says, how in the world do you know that? He says, I packed your parachute. And Plum gasped in surprise, and the man pumped his hands. I guess it worked. (laughs) And Plum assured him it sure did. If your shoot hadn't worked, I wouldn't be here today. Plum couldn't sleep that night thinking about the man. He said, I kept wondering what he might have looked like in a Navy uniform, and I wondered how many times I might have passed him on the Kitty Hawk, how many times I may have, have seen him and not even said, good morning, how are you, or anything, because you see, I was a, a fighter pilot, and he was just a sailor. The plump thought of the many hours that sailor had spent on a long wooden table in the bowels of the ship, carefully weaving the shrouds and folding the silks of each chute holding in his hands each time the fate of someone he didn't know. Plum asks his audience today, who's packing your parachute? Because everyone has someone who provides what they need to make it through the day. Charles Plum's experience reminds us that every church community needs every person playing their part for it to function as it should, as individuals and as churches. Some of those parts are glamorous roles like the fighter pilot, while others will be behind the scenes, out of the way, and apparently of of no consequence like parachute packing. But all of them, as Charles Plum discovered, are vital. We're called to live our Christian walk as a part of the body of Christ. We're called to to work together, to, to care for one another, 
to work together to reach a world in need of a Savior. Brady and I had no conversations about this prior to today. But we've been called to reach as a people, as a church. If one part isn't working right, it will impact the entire body. Life transformation begins with a conscious choice to lay it all down before God. It takes place as we yield to and embrace our God-given roles. Because you see, we cannot be a transformed church unless we are transformed people committed to building the body of Christ. I love how Eugene Peterson translates verses four and five. He says, each of us finds our meaning and function as a part of his body. So since we find ourselves fashioned into all these excellently formed and marvelously functioning parts in Christ's body, let's just go ahead and be what we were made to be. Friends, be who you were made to be. Fulfill your role as a part of Christ's body. We can't be a transformed church unless we are transformed people who are committed to building his body. Because you see, it is a transformed church that has been called to transform their community. Jesus, in the great commandment in Matthew chapter 22, gave us two assignments in there. You remember what they are? Love God, love people. In the Great Commission, he gave us one more assignment. Matthew 28, go make disciples. It is that last assignment that is the bottom line call of a transformed church. Go make disciples. Go make disciples. And to make disciples, it is gonna require that we step out from the walls of this church and engage in the lives of the men, women, boys, and girls who live in our community. It will never happen if all we do is come to church on Sunday and Wednesday and simply learn and learn and learn. All that knowledge, all that knowledge is for naught unless we're all taking that and applying it to our lives and going into the world. I, I started reading a, a book last night and, and um, she quoted this uh, saying from the Asaro tribe of Indonesia in Papua New Guinea. It says, knowledge is only a rumor until it lives in the muscle. Knowledge is only a rumor until it lives in the muscle. You can know everything you want to know about Jesus and about his word, but until your muscles feel you applying that and going to things like the Hope House, until that feels it's just a rumor. Knowledge means nothing until we use it. I was reminded this week again of a, of a powerful scene from the movie Hotel Rwanda, and I, I've, I've shared this before, um, but Hotel Rwanda is about the 1994 uh, conflict that left a million Rwandans dead in just 100 days. Uh, uh, Bill Hybels in the Willow Creek Leadership Summit this last August had, uh, had a lady there who spoke who, who was a part of all of that. Her f entire family uh, died at the hands of, of this group of people trying to exterminate uh, this tribe. She spent three months with several other women in a room the size of a bathroom, fully aware that she could die at any second. But during this conflict, the West, including America, sat idly, uh, idly by just debating the definition of genocide. And then we ultimately took our own people out of the country and we abandoned the Rwandans 
to solve the conflict all on their own. The movie itself is about a hotel manager named Paul, and he uh, begins, in the midst of this, begins to take in refugees from this conflict. They're his own, own people, and he's not going to leave them on the streets to die, and so he's taking them into this hotel, and, and part of the, partway into the movie, a TV cameraman by the name of Jack uh, is watching some of the freshly shot footage that he uh, took of the devastating slaughter that was happening right outside the gates of this, uh, of this hotel. And, and he didn't realize that Paul was also in the room fixing uh, an air conditioner as he was uh, viewing these, these graphic images. And so he later apologizes to Paul for those images. Uh, but Paul believes that when people see the brutality in the gross injustice, he, he tells Jack, I'm glad you shot this footage and that you'll sh have a chance to show it. And Jack responds, but what if no one intervenes? Do you still think it's a good thing to show? And Paul's kind of taken aback and he can't believe it. People wouldn't act on this. How can they not intervene when they look at such atrocities? And how Jack replies is a, is a line that has stuck with me and haunted me multiple times. He says, I think these people will see this footage. They will say, oh my, that's horrible. And then they'll go on eating their dinners. We live in the midst of a spiritual battle for the very souls of our family and friends. Poverty, divorce, alcoholism, depression, teen pregnancy, drug abuse, drug overdoses, suicide, weighing people down, crushing them, every day. All we have to do is turn on the TV. All we have to do is, is open a newspaper, and we will witness the spiritual devastation that's taking place today. But I, I wonder how many times have we simply looked up from our dinners, said, man, that is horrible. The devastation in Blackford County is horrible. Children are dying from overdoses and suicide. That is horrible. How many times have we looked up from our dinners, said that, and then gone back to eating our meal, gone back to our knowledge? Today, within the surrounding community of this church, and in just 50 yards up the hill. There are men and women, boys and girls dying inside. People that you encounter every day need Jesus, and to find them, they need you. Life transformation begins when we as individuals make that conscious choice to lay it all before God. It takes place as we, as we yield to and embrace those, those God-given roles in the body of Christ. Friends, the church is God's primary way to accomplish his purposes on earth today. The church is God's plan A, and there is no plan B. What would happen if we truly believed it? What would happen if we as individuals, as we as a church, would stop talking about it and start doing something about it. I so appreciate the group of 
men and women involved in the outreach, their heart and their desire is to see change happen. But the six of them can't do it by themselves. Henry Varley, a friend of D.L. Moody, once said to him, the world is yet to see what God will do with a man who is fully and wholly consecrated to the Holy Spirit. Said that Mr. Moody replied, may I be that man? I think it, arguably he probably was pretty close. But I think many times the world has yet to see a man or a woman who is fully and wholly consecrated to the Lord. I wonder if the world has seen very many churches that are holy and fully consecrated to the Lord. Because if we are, then our feet should be moving. If we are, we're not only going to learn all we can, and I, that is important. Because you can't go if you don't know anything. But we can't allow that to be all that we do. A transformed people can transform a church. A transformed church can transform a community. A community, a transformed community, can change the world. You sit here today because 12 men decided to get off their chairs and start moving forward. The church is God's primary way to accomplish his purposes on the earth. Let's, you and I, be that church. I want to close today a, a little unique for us, and it's going to cause you to get up, so if you would stand, and we are going to move out from our seats, and what I want to do is I want us to surround this sanctuary, whether it's going down the aisles or whatever, I want us to surround it, I want us to come together and join hands uh, so that as a symbol, we are the church, not just one individual. So if you go ahead and, and move and let's uh, get ourselves out somehow uh, as much as possible uh, in the circle here. And uh, we may have to cut across, I don't know. All right, let's stretch it out. We got a gap back here. Move that way. Shift. <laughs> To your right over here, to your left over there. All right. Father, we thank you so much for your presence here in this place this day. Father, for your love for us being so passionate that you sent your son so that he would die and rise again to reconcile us for eternity. And Father, when you had that plan, you decided that this group of people called Christians would be the ones who would carry that message forward. Father, forgive us for the times when we have miserably failed you. Remind us again and again and again that the people you want to reach right at this moment are likely not even in this room. And may you give us the conviction to step out from our comfort zones and to be the church. I thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Amen. Have a blessed week.